So uh, I guess the next item is ION um, and DMA buff issues. Um, so I sent out a, a, a big long write-up uh, of my understanding of ION that I'm sure was flawed in many ways, um, and hopefully it put everyone to sleep. And <laughs> was, um, but uh, I guess uh, trying to figure out kind of what could be some next steps for possibly upstreaming ION, um, I guess to some, or go ahead. I mean, I think ION is in some ways and some of the constraint solving is papering over limitations in the DMA mapping API in particular that it doesn't support multiple devices and that we don't have enough instruct device to express the constraints of different devices. Okay. I think the right thing to do is solve that. So uh, taking and, the constraint solving right. and that. So um, when I guess we've chatted about trying to, at least for the constraints portion, trying to do something like you were suggesting with basically going and doing attach time with DMA buffs and using that yeah. to aggregate the constraints I mean, and then solving. For, for example, if at map time you have all the devices attached, now you have a list of struct devices, but there's no memory allocation API you can go to and say allocate me memory for all this. And we're missing a few things in DMA params instruct device to express things like I need contiguous memory. I mean, it can already express I can DMA to this range of addresses, but that's about it. Um. So, and assuming that all devices that are going to access a buffer have attached at the point that the first device does map is too great a constraint. You can't do that. Right. So you, you, it's it's the exact same problem. Either you specify some usage bits about who you're going to use a buffer with, and if you're wrong, you have to do some slow path later, or you attach all the devices. I mean, once we once we solve the how do you allocate memory for all these devices, then I think Ion becomes kind of a convenience API on top of that that pre-attaches to different devices and it knows this usage bit mask maps to these devices on this platform, something like that. So you said that, um, I assume that you mean in when Graloc allocates a buffer, it can go, ah, oh, the GPU is going to use that, so I can map that into the GPU. You can say the GPU, the usage flag says that that could possibly right. in the future go into the GPU. But the importing that into the, so if, if it's, being allocated, saying the GPU could access this, then the process that's doing the allocation, you're saying that could then actually import it into the GPU, so that um, the GPU kernel driver attaches to the DMA buff and everything will work. I'm saying I don't think that works because at least on Android, the 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 process and GLES context that's going to be allocating the buffer um, isn't necessarily the one that's going to be sending commands that will write to that buffer. So if your GPU's got multiple VAs, then you, you'll have to, okay, so it works for the solving the constraints, but it's an ugly workaround because you then have to, you know, delete that mapping after you've uh, 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 attached it, passed it to the other process where the other uh, it gets imported into a different GLES context. And so, yeah, that would work, but I, I, I think that could be really quite messy. So, I mean, <clears throat> the difference between ION and DMA buff is DMA buff, you can allocate the buffer, and then as long as you attach before you use the buffer, it can work out, otherwise, slow path. Uh, ION, you just need to know up front, and as far as I know, there's no slow path fallback that copies a buffer. Um, well, you're not allocating through DMA buff. You're not allocating through DMA buff, whereas with ION, you are, right? Right. But I mean, that's a matter of convenience rather than top of it. So, so I guess that part of it is twice. Or maybe you have some sort of internal API where each of the driver can register. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, just, I mean, it's not a very concrete plan, but I mean, I could envision a sort of 
thing where you have ION where a DRM driver and a V4L driver and so on can register an in-kernel API to say, um, you know, if this usage bit is called is set, then call this callback for the allocation and give me a DMA buff back. <laughs> so, okay, so, so, so I understand that, but but yeah, why? Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Go on. Yeah. <laughs> Look, from the Android perspective, like, there's, there's no slow path fallback because the slow path is never acceptable. Like, like, if you have a slow path, then you cannot hit your 60 frames per second. If the CPU has to move your memory, you cannot hit your 60 frames per second. Sure, I mean. And it adds a lot of complexity, so it's just, it's not there. It's not that it couldn't be there. It's just, it's never been needed before. Yeah, I mean, you have, I, I would hope, more control over the user space so that you can orchestrate things so you don't hit the slow path. Mm -hmm. um, the slow path is mainly there for like desktop where there's no central control of the whole desktop stack. And we desktop can't. meaning X and not Wayland. Well, well, X or Wayland. I mean, you know, um, you know, if you look at something like GStreamer, it's fairly decentralized in how it works and how different uh, elements get assembled together into a pipeline at runtime. So. Um, Yeah, I mean, you have hot plug devices and th things like that. So, yeah, I mean, obviously, the you try and push people into doing things in a way that you don't hit the slow path. But you know, it's nice to not explode when you when user space does things wrong. So, on the constraint solving side, uh, we see two problems with that. One is that the constraints like any SOC problem, become obscene. There are bizarre constraints that come out of bizarre hardware all the time. And trying to enumerate some global centralized list of what every possible constraint could be so that you can run a solver, uh, we don't think is a tractable problem, which is why we didn't try and solve it in the current. Right. So I think if you partition constraints into two things, one that's about where the backing pages are and the other category, which is about what the format is, then it becomes easier. The, the kernel, it's, those are the easy constraints. And on well-behaved hardware, that's, those are the only constraints. But we see constraints like the display controller supports 4K pages. But if you use too many of them, it will underflow. How are you going to describe that in a constraint framework? Um, and then the second half of it is that a large amount of where your memory comes from is going to be user space policy based. We know that graphics allocations have to be really fast, so we try and aim them towards carve outs that we know can allocate quickly. We know that camera allocations can generally be pretty slow because they only happen at camera app startup time, so we can aim the, pull those out of uh, just K, uh, Vim allocating them. Uh, how big your carve outs are, where they go, what, what order you want to allocate from them varies based on what the expected use case for your device is. And so you can do an allocation that will work based on constraints. But knowing what the right allocation to do uh, is much harder. Yeah, so, so, so an example that we ran into recently was uh, partially with this display controller that needed large chunks of memory. Uh, and it's a common optimization. You try and allocate large chunks first. Uh, and so we were doing a uh, allocation. We'd call alloc pages order eight and get as many of those as we could. Then alloc pages order four, get as many of those as we could, and then fall back to order zero. And that works for a while until you start hitting fragmentation. And then you're slurping up every big chunk of memory in the system and then subdividing all the little stuff over and over again. And you basically end up fragmenting everything. Yeah. So we said, OK, let's add a new heap called the chunk heap that will just keep an array of one megabyte chunks and parcel them out to whoever requests them, put them back in the pool. It's fixed size, doesn't fragment, nice and easy. If you're using some sort of uh, constraint solver, each device has to say what kind of memory it can it can use. And now you've added a new type of memory. Every device in the system has to get updated to say it can work with this new type. And maybe the chunk heap's easy enough that uh, it fits into an existing constraint. But every new heap 
that doesn't fit into existing constraints requires every device to be updated. And if you don't update one of those devices, you run your constraint solver and you don't use this huge pool of memory that you've allocated at the, at the so, 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 and, well, one Are there just two types of heaps, though? Just a chunk heap and a 4K heap? No, we have the system heap, which is just call alloc page one at a time, returns individual pages, and map them into your GPU if you have a full MMU. Uh, we have the system contig heap that pulls stuff out of the, uh, out, of, out of alloc pages, but always guarantees that they're contiguous. Uh, we have a chunk heap, uh, which returns large blocks uh, of a fixed size. Uh, there's a new CMA heap that tries to, to pull contiguous memory out of CMA. Uh, and then there's device specific heaps for uh, sometimes multimedia and secure have, uh, oh, right. secure is, is another very tricky one where sometimes depending on what user space is doing with the memory, it has to be in a region that is secure only. Uh, and if anybody else touches it, they're gonna fault. So if you've got a device MMU, why would you not use the largest page size? So I know there was a talk yesterday on page migration on IO MMUs, um, which is the first time I, I saw that it will try to allocate um, using the larger page size at first and then fall back to smaller pages if, if that allocation fails. Um, I was wondering whether it would be possible to force that to you know, sit and sleep whilst, you know, pages get moved around until, um, there's, you know, the, the, the larger page allocation c can happen. There's basically never, ever a guarantee that you can allocate more than a single contiguous page. The system can try, and it can try really hard, uh, but, and it often fails uh, because uh, pages are sometimes not movable, especially when you have DMA engines without IOMMUs. Uh, GPUs, is, we cause, cause this problem all the time. They have MMUs, but they don't, <laughs> they, they call alloc pages, they grab a page, and there's no mapping structure to it. You cannot move that page. Uh, and then, so migration so comes along. Reference counting when they actually visit your pages. <laughs> uh, yeah, you don't know when they're mapped into the GPU, I guess. Yeah, we're, we're aware of that particular so you issue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you sprinkle these little 4K allocations all across your memory, and now there's no guarantee that you can ever allocate uh, a one megabyte region. In fact, it becomes very unlikely that you can ever allocate a one megabyte region, and you have to fall back to order four. Uh, in even order four, we've seen order three, order two uh, are problematic if you hit large fragmentation. But, but your fix, your, your fix is to have a, a carve out or a, you know reserve a chunk of memory that you know that you're. What happens if that memory gets exhausted? So or were you on a cheap phone do, and you don't have that much memory? The old way we used to do was to pick a size that we would assume that we would never run out of. You'd make your carve out a little bit too big. Uh, that's bad because it has increased costs. You now need more memory. Uh, you're less efficient with your memory usage. We've moved to, to using multiple heaps with fallback. We'll do as many as we can out of these chunk heaps to keep pressure off of the system memory. And then in the, the few burst cases where you need more than the, uh, the chunk heap has available, then you'll fall back to allocating stuff out of the system heap. Uh, and then you start putting more pressure on the system heap, and, uh, on the, the system memory in terms of fragmentation and memory usage. It's also important to realize there's, this is a latency sensitive operation. Yeah. So kicking off migration is very counter to that. But don't you have a lot of times where sleeping a lot of the time, right? So K-swap-D kicks itself off when you run into fragmentation issues, when you don't have large amounts of memory. And it runs in the background and tries to recreate large amounts of memory. We have played with tunables to increase the amount of memory it's trying to keep available. By default, it's trying to keep on our devices something like two megabytes available, which is irrelevant to, uh, to graphics memory. We've bumped that up to something like 48 megabytes, uh, and that, that can help, but now you have 48 megabytes of memory that you can't use. You're always keeping it free. So you can get it, but you don't, you don't get it when you need it. Yeah, you, so you can accelerate it so that at least when you do try and get it, it's probably there and you can get it quickly and you just delay the work to doing it somewhere else. But 
that then you're still, you're predicting what is your maximum allocation size in a short period of time. Yeah. Well, I, I do still think there's at least some low hanging fruit that should be better expressed in like struct device DNA params. Um, you know, maybe we can even add some stuff in there like preferred chunk size or something like that that's kind of I mean, advisory. I, maybe, maybe that's not the complete solution, but. A, a large part um, of the ion code is, is the various heaps, the various ways of allocating memory. And if, if those were usable by ion, which knows which heap it wants to use, and usable by DMA buff, which can deduce which heaps it want to use, use, there's at least a lot of code reuse that can happen there, even if the exact APIs that are used. Yeah, uh, I mean, e even in the, <coughs> Even in the cases where we can't come up with a generic way to express the constraints, there can, I suppose, still be special purpose allocation drivers which register into ION, which basically looks like a heap. I mean, I think the heaps are kind of registrable anyways. So. Uh, I guess one thing I'm worried about with the ION interface is that the heaps, um, so it's just a little bit field. If something like an ion interface was merged upstream, yeah. <laughs> so if something like an ion interface was merged upstream, I'd, I'd want to make it so that what's actually exposed is not uh, 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 the user space heap ID thing isn't um, strictly defined, and it's something that you can query devices to be able to pull. Like, what is on this kernel that's currently running? You know some sort of indirection table of heaps. So it's able to say, well, there's only 32 possible heaps on a single system, but the specific types could be quite variable. There's no reason that it has to be a single flags mask. It can be an array of, of integers that comes in from user space. It's just on, on any system uh, that we expect to see in the near future, we both have custom kernels per device right. and so, uh, a small number of heaps on each device. So a, a yeah. mask works fine, but yeah, it's just there's no reason it has to say that way. Something that we'd have to support forever. We need to have <laughs> something. And I mean, you know, Zach was talking about like, could it even be strings or something crazy where you could just well, I mean, have a like, larger. Could you, could I mean, you separate out the mechanism? So things like the IOMMU are attached to the struct device. So if you have something that you can map to a bunch of struct devices, somehow ideal, I mean, I keep coming back to the struct device should represent at least as much of the constraints as we can. Because I mean, you, you have the same thing for, <coughs> for systems that are allocating outside of ION. You know, if GPU driver uses IOMMU, you get better performance if you're not thrashing the TLB. Yeah, yeah we, we would also prefer to be able to express that, hey, when we do DMA alloc, uh, we want things that are more chunky, uh, if you will. Yeah, I mean, th this isn't a constraints um, problem. That, that particular issue isn't a constraints problem where in terms of you've got two different devices in trying to settle constraints. And that sounds like you've used DMA alloc coherent and it's not give it it's, doesn't give you a chunk size that's um, big enough. And so to work around a deficiency in DMA alloc coherent, you've created a new um, uh, heap that that you can rely on on giving you the larger chunk sizes. It's not purely about relying on it to get large chunk sizes. Uh, a large part of it is uh, that taking large chunks of memory away from Linux makes it very unhappy uh, and may not be possible. Uh, so, so sure, the, the chunk heap uh, on Exynos where you have to have large chunks is just a workaround. But on many other systems, it prevents system fragmentation. It, it takes something that you can, you can allocate chunks the first time, but this makes sure that you can do it the second and third time. And I don't think there is a way to guarantee that you can do that. Do that. The Linux MM subsystem explicitly does not guarantee that you can get large chunks from it. Sure. Okay, so if it's, it's not the Linux MM subsystem, but why couldn't you put 
a uh, one of these large um, reserved heaps behind uh, DMA alloc uh, or one of the many DMA alloc functions? Uh, well, you just need to specify that one megabyte chunks are enough. Something has to specify if I need a 16 megabyte buffer, is that 16 one, one megabyte chunks or is that a single 16 megabyte buffer? Say so DMA alloc coherent is a single 16 megabyte buffer. But uh, chunk heap is not returning contiguous one megabytes. But I think the, I thought the um, IOMU framework did actually say what the various page sizes it supported were. And if it doesn't, then maybe that could be added. Was it, uh, I mean, if 90 it was sure. supported and, you know, there's the, 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 you know, as long as you have enough one meg pages. Yeah, but, um, so it sounds like, no, you don't have enough one meg pages, and that, that's the real problem. But instead of trying to solve that by having a completely separate thing that's not allocated from using DMA alloc functions, but, uh, you know, an ion alloc function, could you not stick that behind the DMA alloc functions? Kind of, I said you have a uh, DMA segment boundary mask, which kind of I think says you want your chunks aligned to this, some multiple of this. So that's kind of. I mean, it, it's, it's not hard to take one constraint and satisfy it through DMA alloc coherence. Uh, but it sounds like it's, it doesn't. It, it it is hard because if your constraint is I want more my page, page sizes, then after a couple of days of the device running, you fragment it, and uh, that doesn't well, give I it mean, to you. you can put the heat, the, the chunk heat behind DMA alloc coherence. So DMA alloc okay, coherence, yeah. and you give it a chunk size, and it'll give you back memory, and that would work fine. Yeah. Then what happens when you need to add, ask for secure memory? Now you have DMA alloc coherent with a chunk size and a secure flag, and then you well, can't just add every single constraint. Well, there is, there is DMA alloc adders. Yeah. I mean, so we you can just flag. have attributes that specify all this stuff. And it, it, it sounds like, you know, the, the ion heap ID and the set of, you know, attributes, I mean, it's, it's the same thing, in, at least in my very simple mind. The, the heap ID is a set of attributes, implicitly, that user yeah, space yeah, knows yeah. what are the attributes of this heap. Uh, the question is, can you enumerate enough of those attributes that a generic piece of code right. uh, could always work? I guess I'm, I'm just skeptical that we need, I mean, next one was, can we just have the heaps enumerated in the kernel and let devices, you know, pick from that pool? Because it doesn't really have to be that we have every device abstract and says, here's the full capabilities, and then we try to match up which heaps actually match. You know, like, that's a thing where I'm just like. But then you have the new heap problem. Yeah, but in, in, in terms, it's in terms of the kernel, it's one but of those things where it's not hard. It's kind of a. Can, can we actually enumerate what these constraints are? Because I've been trying to go through it, and we've done it on the DRI dev list. And you know, the, the chunk size is one. And if you consider that to be, um, you know, the uh, contiguous as well, as in it's got to be one chunk. Um, the other one is uh, stride alignment, like uh, uh, pitch alignment. I asked on DRI Devel, does anybody have any other requirements other than those two? And, and I, I, people probably ignore my email, but I mean, are you aware of any other? Um, uh, I mean, secure, obviously, is, is so, so the next secure, one. Okay, yeah. uh, a lot of it, though, is not constraints, it's policy. Often during development, we'll switch around the order of heaps uh, when we decide that on this particular device, uh, the, we would rather put pressure on the chunk heap. We'd rather make the chunk heap bigger and use it earlier and take pressure off the system heap. Uh, and over time, the ordering of those constraints changes. So it's not always just about what can you use, it's about preference. What's the best thing to use on this particular device? Okay, okay. But it, it, in terms of, because uh, I mean, you, you've seen a whole heap more hardware than I have. Have you seen hardware which has constraints other than uh, what, what we've discussed. Even if it's like, it's more optimal if it uses memory that's, you know, got a two in the number of bytes or something. Uh, we've seen, not so much recently, but we've seen, seen asymmetric memory where uh, you have fast memory and slow memory and you want to allocate some with some preference out of fast and slow. I don't think we've seen that maybe even since G1. So that's just DMA uh, mask. Uh, but that's not a DMA requirement, problem. that's a preference. Yeah. 
So, so we may want to use the fast memory for display and the slow memory for camera. Yeah. So it sounds it sounds like uh, it sounds like it's maybe not too hard to add the absolute requirements. It gets a little harder to add the order of preference. Like these are my requirements, but this is actually what I prefer, which is above and beyond the requirements. And how does that get prioritized? Okay, but, but fast memory that's that is a new one. That that's one. We now have three. There's the Tyler, but I don't think that was ever treated as a heap. That's a, a 2D IOMMU. So it introduces a lot of fun problems, but uh, <laughs> heap is not one of them. Like, where, where the memory tower? Uh, I haven't investigated the ones we have too closely. Yeah, MSM, I have not dug into their, their crazy heaps, but they do have a lot of heaps they've invented. I guess the other thing you want to talk about those? If even having just the, the, right now in the newer, hard, uh, in the newer hardware, uh, there's just the, um, we moved to the IOMMU heaps mostly. So there's the IOMMU and there's the secure and there's a contiguous heap. That's it. Right now. <laughs> the IOMMU heaps are those, um, is that an optimization so that you allocate memory that you already have mapped into your uh, devices uh, VA so that you don't have to remap that in? Okay. So that, that might be one possibility. You know, you, you want a heap because that whole heap is allocated, is, has a VA, and you know, you don't have to remap it every time you want to start using an allocation from that heap. Yeah. There are some unrelated IOMMU optimizations that can be made. The upstream IOMMU framework's not really ideal for fast allocation and freeze. Yeah. Uh, as far as that uh, preference versus requirement um, As far as the preference versus requirement portion. So one thing that I've been trying to think of is, is there a way that we can have at least an interface where it will work, the requirements can be satisfied, but for the Android case, they are able to just statically set for this hardware that this is the magic heap cookie that we want for camera stuff. And this is the magic heap cookie that we want for that. So they don't even have to do some sort of querying of devices to see which heaps are supported in order to figure out what they're passing in. And so they do have that fast path, but then we still have a generic interface that will still function if some new, you know, hot plug PCI device shows up that we need to use as well that we hadn't considered. How do you hook the so the heap. Well, that, this is. A, the, so the heaps are, are, aren't dynamic, right? So like on the on on that build on that machine, there's a fixed set of heaps. The problem is is that there may be more heaps in the future, and so we don't want to define a, a bit mask that says this is heap, you know, foo, and bar, you know, specifically because on every machine it might be a different set of heaps, and so the idea is that the hardware um, has their sets of preferences of what they require. And so, you know, they're not, the driver's not going to run on a system that doesn't have the heat that's supported. But being able to have from user space um, to, to if, if you were looking, you know, if you knew what kernel you were running, you could from user space specify the heap cookie and have, an, have that insight all the way through. Because that's, I mean, the Android guys want to have that user land knowledge that shoots all the way through the kernel and they don't want to have to do probing and checking all the devices um, because they know because it's fixed you know and so that aspect of having something where we do have that straight through f path but in the other conditions where we're dealing with desktop systems or something like that we're able to still have a query and have things still work and it may not be optimal if we haven't updated the driver to say that actually for you know this driver we can use this new heap that we've added recently or something like that. Um, is that crazy or is that? So I mean maybe in the short term I don't know if people would like that upstream but it would be maybe not too intrusive to have a list you know a pointer or a list of pointers to heaps for each device and then you have a set of devices, find the intersection of that. I mean, for upstream, I think we do want to 
add a few more things so that we could at least express the absolute requirements, if not the preferences. I mean, we should probably do the preferences as well, but <clears throat> but that's maybe going to take time to get everyone to agree on. Um, but if the, the if problem with the preferences, they're, they're not they're not specified by the device. They're specified by the board. Yeah. Um, another one Zach brought up was power. You may have uh, array self refresh, uh, partial array self refresh. Vendors keep coming to and then not using, but. Eventually, I figure people are going to start shutting down half of their memory, and so you're going to have preferences about where do you want your memory allocated, what things do you know you can clean out, uh, what are what's transient and can go in the memory that'll get shut off, and what's permanent and needs to go in the yeah. In the well, memory. so there's you're not going to solve that with migration even on the desktop. You're not going to be able to migrate out of that entire. Well, no. I mean, one of the use cases of migration was so that you could shut off some of your memory, you know, hot but plug some of your DMA memory. DMA and but migration is, interact very poorly. Yeah, I mean, you you really need your drive. If you have a display on, if you have a buffer on the screen, and you leave it there for a long time, you're not moving that memory. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, it gets easier if drivers actually tell you when they're not DMAing to or from the memory. But, uh, but that's a, that'll always be best effort. At, at some point, you probably need some sort of shrinker interface to say, hey, I want this memory back. Go behind the scenes, copy your frame buffer to some other location. Once that's done copying, switch the scan out address. And then you're doing it at the buffer um, level. So migration's working at a page level. It can't right. go, I need to move all of these pages atomically. Right. So I'm not quite sure how that should work. But uh, back back a little bit to the co topic of system tuning. Um, I think <clears throat> once we do have a way to express better what the constraints are, then okay, come up with some way for device tree to populate those fields in the device, or some helper, or something to make it easier to tweak those. Um, but I mean, if we don't have a way to express those constraints in the first place, there's no point to talking about how to tune those constraints. Um, but. Okay. No, sir, are you putting all those, cons or is Qualcomm putting all those constraints in the third device tree file about all their memories and the property of the memory and whether it's turned off and all that stuff? That actually ends up being a whole separate problem with device tree because you're not describing hardware, you're describing kernel configuration. Yeah, or. Somewhat acceptable. So. No, it's, it's, we, Not we, to me. We've already. <laughs> that's, that's the issue that they're already starting to push through. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know how the, the tuning part of it should work, but I do know if you can't express those constraints, there's no point in tuning them. Um, so, I mean, from well, a. I mean, today we, we write like, in the graphic, like, the, 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 the tuning is expressed as code. Sure. So moving, moving from code to a set of integers. Uh, yeah, okay, but I mean, yeah, I mean, my point is some of the same problems you're solving there, we really do need to solve anyways in the DMA mapping. So, I mean, there might be, I mean, I would roughly envision this as, you know, the idea of maybe having a list of heaps in struct device for Android kernel makes at least the APIs on top of that that the drivers use the same. <laughs> um, so I mean, maybe that's a temporary solution while we work out better how to. Sure we're ever going to get away from our buffers being allocated through user space, right? So, no. I'm so so I mean, I mean, taking like internal like GL buffers and stuff aside, but the the big buffers that we move between processes are always going to be allocated by the compositor or something. That Sure. I mean, most most drivers do something in response to user space asking them to do something. Right, but, 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 but it's not going to go to like. I mean, I guess it could go to every single piece of hardware. Yeah. I mean, but going my, to every piece of hardware brings up permissions problems. Uh, yeah. Today, yeah. Surface Flinger allocates all of our buffers. I think the intention is that individual processes will allocate their buffers in the future, but if they're allocating a media buffer. The process probably doesn't have permission to open dev media, whatever. It's going to pass it to media server. Media server has permission. It definitely doesn't have 
Yeah, so it, it, so the, the process that's doing the allocation may not have permission to talk to every piece of hardware. And as Tom said, even if it did have permission to talk to the piece of hardware, it talking to the piece of the hardware may not be the same as the person who's going to later talk to the piece of the hardware. Uh, if it's gonna pass it to the compositor, it's gonna be a different GL context. I mean, is that necessarily a problem? I mean, if you it comes a, down a to you need, a, attach. you need a, a proxy somewhere that has permission to open these devices and allocate on behalf of Do you mean a user else. space proxy or a? Probably, because it's easier to open a device from user so every space. Every time you want to allocate, <laughs> you have to RPC to four other processes and ask them to each pass this buffer in. And well, I was kind of assuming it'd be one central process, but maybe that's not a good assumption. Yeah, that's what I mean, now. Not really. I mean, well, we RPC to Surface Flinger, yeah. but if you're talking about having to talk to every piece of hardware, Surface Flinger doesn't have permission to open dev media or whatever the media server yeah. stuff mm. is. Uh, so permission separation, especially when it involves vendor code talking to vendor hardware, we try and run those in separate processes with separate permissions. Uh, and so there's at least two today, uh, maybe even three if you include secure. Uh, where you're, you're gonna be RPCing to both Surface Flinger and Media Server in order to be able to talk to both of those pieces of hardware. So one question I've always had is, when you implemented ION, why have that API? Why not just have the usage flags as the, basically move the Graloc interface from user space into kernel space? So when Surface Flinger wants to do an allocation, so you have a per SOC driver. Uh, mostly and because it's it, it, a large amount of it is policy. Like you'd have to modify the kernel every every time we want to change a user space use case of how we use memory. Doesn't it come back to the same thing Eric said about sync, where you know you you have this contract that is somewhat nebulously specified, and then you have a vendor implementing that contract, maybe not quite the way you meant it and you end up at this disconnected mass of behaviors that don't necessarily meet what you're But the contract at the moment is with um, you know, the interface for Android into the allocation routine is a user space interface. I guess my yeah, question I mean, is I mean, why, I mean, why not move that into a kernel space? There, there's anything that's not feasible against sort of pushing the Gralic API down into a kernel API. Right. Except that generally the Gralics are Board slash device specific. Yeah. Product and specific. And, 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 yeah, product specific. They're tuned to be product specific. So now you're moving all of that product specific tuning code into the kernel. Yes. We sort of have the Seems opposite like question idea. is, which is, but, but, I mean, why it, should the API be, why should the device, or the, the non device specific API be between user space and the kernel? If you look at GL, that's not where it is. <laughs> the GL API is to a library. The library talks to the kernel using something private. So why don't so, you move GL? So, so I'm not suggesting that you, you, you standardize on the Graloc um, interface being a kernel interface. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is, so any vendor, you don't have to use ION, right? You can use whatever you want. Um, but you chose to implement an uh, ION. Why did you choose to implement it with the interface it has? You could have chosen to implement it where you've, you have... So it's still optional, but the interface into it is you pass in the usage flags. Uh, because we wanted a place in user space to make a mess per product, rather than having to make a mess in the kernel for every device per product. I mean, <laughs> yeah. So um, and when you say but not for not so, for this particular case. Right. So when uh, you say sorry, when you say product, you mean SOC or no, I mean, device? No, I mean oh. SOC right. plus its yeah. display. Plus right. Its so feature you've got sets. two products with two different Graloc implementations that are using the same SOC. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I mean, three <laughs> and, and four. And they use it, or yeah, multiple I mean, I mean, products that are using the same SOC. SOC. Especially on. And they, they start with one Gralic that will support all of their chips. And then per product, they kind of hack around it and specialize it 
uh, fix bugs, but they don't want to introduce bugs in the product that's already shipped, and they end up having separate implementations of Grelic for four similar devices. And we don't want them to do that in the kernel. But you don't mind them doing it in user space? Uh, they're going to do it somewhere. We'd yeah. rather that be in a nice, self-contained, vendor-specific, product-specific right. piece of code than yeah, then, <laughs> then do it in the kernel every single time. I mean, right. our philosophy is that you have to have a place to make this mess. It would be nice if you didn't. Yeah. They are, there is always going to be this mess. I, and I guess, and so I, in my mind, I would see it that the mess living in a very small kernel module that then calls in and does the allocations. But if you're saying when it, for whatever reasons that's distasteful. When it's that, talking to four or five then, devices in the kernel, it's never small, because there's never good APIs to talk to lots of different devices. Well, even so, like, like where is that module source going to live? Is it going to live in the kernel source? Is it going to live in the external kernel source? Like, having it live external in the kernel source sucks, because now you've got to go compile no. something else. And then now, like, you think Linus was, was hated the, the ARM, you know, dev kit figs? Wait till every single phone has, like, an, an allocator that's yeah. checked in the kernel. Yeah. <laughs> So, so I think I think next steps might be something yeah. like real close to uh, <laughs> Does doing something where we start specifying um, the size of you know pointers to keeps rather than pure uh, constraints might be a solution to kind of get at least the internal portion of it, but it's the aspect of what we actually do for user interface. So I just feel like the the, the attach 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 on the you know map is Yeah, like, I mean like, so I mean, one of my big preferences is that APIs that drivers use in the kernel are standardized. Like, I don't like it when drivers have to, well, okay, it gets hard to push a driver upstream if it depends on an API that's not upstream, or if it depends on, it gets hard to use that driver outside of an Android context when it depends on a API that <coughs> only exists in an Android context. So, so one of the things about Ion, um, especially after DMA buff, is that that's no longer the case. Right. By, by moving all of this complexity of allocation out and the drivers can just assume that they're going to get something that they can handle and if they don't, they throw it away. Now those drivers are easily upstreamable. Okay, so... I mean, I mean maybe, yeah, that, maybe the, the approach is doing both. Is that is that you approach sort of the constraint solver that you're saying, uh, which is seems like necessary in a desktop use case where you're not going to yeah. be writing a special piece of code for each laptop. Right. Um, and then in parallel, you have some way for a piece of user code to, to guide that constraint solver or override it. And then, and then Somehow they end up getting backed by the same teams. Yeah. Um, so, the, so at least you're sharing that. Code. The um, the heaps in Ion are where the interesting code is. the The rest of like the user space interface is is not interesting code that really needs to be shared between desktop and and. Yeah, I mean, if there was just an Android. API that let us say allocate this much from this heap, I mean that's essentially what the allocation side. Yeah, I think the the one thing I would like to see, and it's been a while since I looked at Ion, and I think last time I looked at Ion it wasn't possible, but it would be nice for an allocator to just say, here's a struct DMA buff, um, and to have some way that we can plug in, like for desktop DRM drivers, have some API in the kernel that they can register as a heap, so Android user space sees the familiar Ion API, but under the hood everything's working the same. So that, that would that be kind of nice. That to me sounds like it would be an Ion heap that knows how to talk to the driver. Right. Uh, there's just there's a few functions to implement. You basically just have to be able to return an SG list of your memory that you've allocated to Ion. So I, I think, I mean, could we make that so it just returns a DMA buff instead? That would make it easiest to fit in with like. There's a few. TDM. I'd have to look again, but I think there's a few operations that Ion does on the heap that would not be supported on the DMA buff. Um, 
then you close that gap. Yeah. Yeah, I mean. Put those operations into DMA buff. Yeah, then you could have a heap that is just take a DMA buff. I mean, if you want to get an SG list from it, you ask it for its SG list. If right, you want exactly. To map it into user space, you call its map box. That, that would actually might work today. Yeah, I, I mean. Guess also, it's, it's worth keeping some context that Ion was designed before DMA buff existed. Oh, sure, yeah. And so some of its design is driven towards functionality that then was implemented by DMA buff. Sure, sure. Um, and so, and so at, on its own, maybe it's not the right fit to just wholesale import. I don't know. Um, but one of one of the things we did lose in that is Ion had the idea of a client that that anybody that if to in order to import an Ion handle even in the kernel you had to have a client and right. then we had a lot of good debugging for who had references on what memory and so if you're getting into memory leak conditions and you're using DMA buff it's kind of hard to track down who has that last reference. So we did add, um, Smith added some debug FS. Um, it's maybe not as extensive, but. Yeah, I mean, I mean what, what we um, want to do is we want to be able to point a finger at a driver. Right. Or a so user space allowed. process. I think that should be. Well, it's not so much who allocated it that we're interested in. It's, it's who attached it. The allocator can overwrite it. Yeah, but, so but, 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 but there's, but there's still no concept of right? who's when you take a reference on it, it's an anonymous reference. Like when I'm a driver and I'm a display controller and I get a buffer and I get get the <coughs> buffer and I get a DMA buff out of that. Yeah, you don't, you don't know. And nothing's tracking the fact that I have a reference to it until I put it. Yeah, so your, your attachments are... A, a name associated with it. You, I, I see, it's a mapping between a struct dev and a DMA buff. Oh, okay. So if you, is there a list of all DMA attachments in existence somewhere? I believe so. If it we'll would be... Build yeah, yeah. I mean, if we, we could build it on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I have no objections to spiffing out DMA buff to make it more debuggable, things like that. I mean, I think that's... Uh, approach we should take for Ion Upstream um, is to make it fit in better with. The one that might not work is user space. When user space gets an FD buff, or a, a DMA buff, it's just duping the FD. Mm -hmm. And the only way to track down that a particular user space process owns a DMA buff is by going backwards through proc FD. And then all DMA buffs have the same name in proc FD. Uh, I have in the past had to give a custom name with the structure address of the DMA buff to every single one to debug which which process was holding on to the last DMA buff reference. Yeah. All right, I think everybody's really getting the movie, so I feel like we should move into the lunch discussion. <laughs> lunch. So uh, <laughs> thanks so much, everybody, for coming and contributing. Uh, yeah, hopefully this keeps going. Where uh, <laughs> it is now.